Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. <clears throat> awesome. Okay. Luke chapter 11. Now, I'll start with a question. What are you, as a Christian, as a disciple, most concerned about? What are you most concerned about? I don't want the right answer, because all of us could give the right answer. Um, but what is truly your answer from your own soul? Like, what, as a Christian, are you most concerned about? And I want to stretch that <clears throat> to even our church at North Valley Baptist Church. Like, as a church, and the word church is just the word ecclesia in the Greek, which means the gathering, the assembly. We are the church, okay? So, as North Valley Baptist Church, what are we most concerned about? Where, where do we put our concern as a church. You see, actions can tell us a lot about uh, where our concerns are, because usually what we're concerned about, we act upon, right? And also, not only do um, actions tell us what our concerns are and vice versa, but what we're concerned about also helps us realize how we understand our identity, right? If I'm concerned about being healthy, physically healthy. If, I, if there's this concern with me, well, my actions will be probably trying to get fit, trying to diet, trying to do all these different things. And that also says something about my perceived identity, that I am to be a fit male, you know? And so it tells me something about my, how I perceive to be, like, who I am, right? So what you are concerned about, where your heart is at, what you're thinking about, what you're kind of anxious about, what your concern is, says a lot. It kind of dictates where you're going to go with your actions, and it also helps you realize whether you kind of, it's conscious or not, where you, what you kind of see yourself to be in that identity kind of way. So I was thinking about this in terms of the North American church. Now, I know I pick a lot on the North American church. It's not that I'm picking on the bride of Christ. I love the bride of Christ um, and all of her, her, her warts <laughs> and rashes. We know truly that God has washed her clean and she's pure. And, uh, and, it's, and she's beautiful. But I want to look at the North American church here, maybe the institution more or less, and kind of look at some of her actions. Some of the institution's actions in North America with a very, very broad brush stroke to help us maybe see, again, whether it's conscious or not, what their perceived identity is. So what is the North American church concerned with? Um, and how does that then help us understand uh, what their identity is. I, I would say this, based on their, the North American church's main activities, we might see many churches as identifying themselves as comfortable and accepting community gatherings. That's it, right? Because, and why would we say that? Because a lot of churches make a lot of effort to provide just that. Their concern, their focus is to provide a space, usually on Sundays, to be the most comfortable community gathering possible. And that's, their, that's where their concern is. They believe themselves mostly to be a place where you come. We don't have wooden hard pews, but soft plushy seats. Um, and, and, and everything, we want to make sure it's all very, very accepting, inclusive, and comfortable. Also, based on their main activities, we might see many churches in North America identifying themselves as merely social service providers. When you look through their weeks and their months and their goals and their vision, it's all kind of around providing physical needs for others. Now, am I saying that's wrong? Not at all. Am I saying the one before that was wrong to be, be comfortable? No, I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong. But if all of the church's activities are just that, providing social services out, that says something about how the church perceives her identity. They merely are a community service. That's it. The next one I'll say, uh, how they perceive their identity to be based on their actions, based on their concerns, is something that I don't think many churches would um, like affirm, but maybe it is truly kind of there, is that they see themselves as entertainment venues. And what I mean by that is that their concern and their, their anxiety kind of comes to that point of keeping people in by kind of giving them what they would like. So if we have a really elaborate, I remember, and again, I'm not... This has nothing to do with people's hearts, okay? This has nothing to do with people's hearts. I'm just thinking through th the identity of the church. But I remember going into one church down in the States when Brittany and I were on a, a, a tour uh, with our college to help promote our college. And we walked into this one church, I don't know if Brittany remembers this, in Indiana. 
in Fort Wayne. And it was a massive building. And we walked in, and you look down to the left-hand side of the building after you walked into the lobby, and it looked like you were walking into Disneyland. Like, the, the, the elaborate childcare center was just, like, amazing. I'm like, who wouldn't want to bring their kids here? This is awesome. But you could see that obviously much concern was put, and money and effort and activity was put into this elaborate childcare center. So I think a lot of churches, maybe, and again, I'm not touching hearts, but I'm just looking very generally, like, maybe they see themselves, their identity being a place to entertain, a place to keep people in, to provide what people want. Now, these concerns lead, right, to implied identities and missions of what the church is and what the church ought to do. But I want to ask us, everything that I've said, I'm not saying any of these things are necessarily wrong in and of themselves. Is it wrong for us to provide food for the homeless? Absolutely not. Is it wrong for us to, you know, have coffee and have nice seats here? No. Is it wrong for us to have a good childcare ministry? No. But is this it? Is this what the church is? And is this what the church is made for? Were you and I born again from above, washed by the Spirit, washed with water, so that we now can provide a nice comfy seat for someone on a Sunday? Is that it? I want us to hear from God, from the Word. I, I, I found these seven passages, just verses, that help us see the, the, the true identity and, and the mission of the church. So I'm just going to read these, these verses out and just get a glimpse of how God sees the bride of Christ, and how God desires the bride of Christ put all of her concern toward. So, first one, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, Paul writes this, to the church of God. We could stop right there and just spend lots of time. The church of God, the assembly of God. The church belongs to God. We are God's people. Isn't that amazing? We're not missions, one of just one of the mission community groups. Like we are God's people. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says that we are his chosen possession, his treasure. We are God's people. I love it, but we'll go on. So to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those, so then he explains what is this church of God. <clears throat> to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now that word sanctified is so rich. It basically means you have been set apart. You are holy. And it's not because we ourselves have, through much discipline and self-control, like, we've, you know, stopped, you know, our potty mouths. We've, 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 we've gone into ha good habits of doing this and doing this, and now we're different from the world. Notice that it says you are sanctified in Christ Jesus, that there is a full-on holiness that has been imputed to us, transforming us because of our union with Jesus Christ. So there's a supernatural element of the church. The church is not just nice, moral, you know, go-lucky people. These are, we are redeemed, clothed with robes of righteousness, transformed from the inside, no longer hard hearts, new hearts, new creations in Christ. This is who we are. It goes on, called to be saints together. So there's the unity factor with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I, that's an amazing verse that describes who the church is. Holy in Christ Jesus, set apart from the world, God's treasured people. I'll go on. Ephesians 1, 22-23. God the Father put all things under Jesus Christ's feet and gave him as head over all things, meaning authority over all things, to the church. That is amazing. We just preached through Ephesians, and I don't remember really spending time on that, and I should have, because that is amazing. Just get this. God the Father, who is King of kings, Lord of lords, fully, like completely, has given his son, Jesus Christ, authority over everything. That's Matthew 28, right? All authority in heaven, earth, heaven and earth has been given to me. And God the Father has given this Jesus, who is head over all things, to us. And then he goes on to put all things under Jesus' feet, gave him his head over all things to the church, and then, just nonchalantly, Paul's like, which is his body? Which is his body? So, we're not just given this head that just kind of sits there, and we're all like, oh, praise the head, right, of, of, of Jesus. God has placed the head, Jesus Christ, over all things on us 
and we're connected to him as the body of Christ. So we now walk in that authority, in the power, and the confidence of being over all things. The Christians, true, genuine Christians, ought to learn more and more and more every day of just the incredible confidence and boldness they have in this world. That we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies already. This Jesus, who God has given all things to, has been given to us, and we walk with him as his body. It is amazing. It's amazing. I'll keep going. Ephesians 3, chapter 10. Through the church, and let's just make this personal, through us. And if I had time, I would say through Mike and Luella and Barry and Jeanette and Rob and Kara. It's through us, the manifold wisdom of God is to be now made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You and I, individually and corporately, have the role and the responsibility to make known to not just people, but to the heavenly realms, the manifold wisdom of God, his salvation, his wonder, his majesty. God has decided not just to come down and show the heavenly realm himself. Just He's like, I want to use the church. I'm going to use the church as the way that I'm going to display my manifold wisdom to the otherworldly realm. That's amazing. Think about that. That's your responsibility and your mission. That's who you are. You are God's chosen instrument to display his wisdom and his power, not even just to those in this world, but to those <clears throat> in the heavenlies. It's amazing. Ephesians 5, 23, 24. Christ is the head of the church. We've learned about that, his body, and is himself its savior, and the church submits to Christ, submits to Christ. He is the king. Part of the identity and mission of the church is to submit to King Jesus. We do not submit end all be all to anything around us. Ultimately, it is to Christ the King. That's very important to know. Ephesians 5.27, Jesus cleanses us, the church, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, so that she might be holy and without blemish. 1 Timothy 3.15, this is an amazing one. I want you to know, this is Paul speaking to Timothy, how one ought to behave in the household of God, and then he explains that, which is the church of the living God. The people of the living God are to be and act as a household, the household of God. And then he goes on to describe what this household of God is to be and is. He says, they are a pillar and a buttress of the truth. A pillar of the truth. We are the foundation. God has decided, amazingly, to, to bestow upon his church, his people, to be the place upon which all the world can see what truth is. When God wants to demonstrate his truth and show his truth to the world, he just says, well, look to the church because they are the pillar and the buttress of the truth. This has so much implications on who we are and what we are to do. Lastly, the last one I'll give, Revelation 120, after this vision that John the Apostle is given on Patmos, he says uh, that he's given the interpretation of these lampstands. And in chapter Revelation 1.20, uh, it turns out that these seven lampstands are the seven churches. And that helps us understand something about churches, that they are lampstands to shine the light of God in the midst of darkness. So kind of summarizing that, listen, just capture this identity and this, and this purpose and this mission of what God understands his bride, the church, to be. We, North Valley Baptist Church, we, you and I, this isn't theoretical. This is real. We are people of the living God, living as a household, who have all individually been redeemed, liberated, delivered from sin and death, and now make up the body of Christ on earth as new creations, supernatural creations through our union with Jesus. With Christ is now as our head, okay, who is above all things, <clears throat> who we submit to as king, who has cleansed us, purified us, because we're his body, and like anyone does, they cleanse their body. Jesus cleanses his own body. He's part of him. 
we now boldly and lovingly display and proclaim the light of God's wisdom and truth to a dark and dying world and heavenly world. Just like when a lamp or a light lightens the room. So my question is, I mean, these are just a few. These are seven scriptures. I mean, we could go more and more what the church is and and what the church is to do. But when did we shift from this glorious description of who we are to now being mostly concerned and anxious about being a community gathering that provides some motivational speaking and fun childcare? Like, I just feel like something's missing. Like, how did we get from this amazing, bold, almost impossible, it seems, reality of who we are as the church and the splendor and the glory of who we are to now just like, oh, we come together for a couple of minutes, you know, each week and we sing some songs. And it's like, wait, something, something, seems, something seems off about what we are concerned most about. This biblical identity, this biblical mission are, are really summed up in the Great Commission, which is to make disciples of this King Jesus. You see, I believe that if we focus on being disciples of King Jesus and making disciples of King Jesus, all of what we just talked about will just naturally progress and move forward. Now, a quick side note here, I just want to make sure we realize this, because when we talk about the church corporately, it can be easy for us just to sort of hide ourselves. Well, we're talking about the church, not about me, but that's not the case. There's no dichotomy in scripture between a disciple and the church. Whenever you read about the identity and the mission of the church, Understand it to be the, the identity and the mission of you as a disciple, as an individual disciple. You can't separate the two. It's, it's impossible. Okay, so that's just a quick side note. I just want to make sure that as we talk about the church, I'm talking about me, and I'm talking about you individually. So if we want to embrace, church, a biblical and thus powerful and true identity and mission that's actually, you know, true of who we are as the church, something that's going to actually flip mission upside down, for God's glory, then my question is, what is the key for us to make disciples and followers of Jesus? Now, I'm going to say something that is not simplistic, um, but it is simple, and it's this. Our concern is not that we provide a cushy environment, is not that we make sure that we have all these ministries and make sure everything works to a T, and our, our concern shouldn't be just making sure that people come back the next Sunday. Our concern ought to be that we individually and corporately follow and worship King Jesus. That's where your concern, is, concern should be. If me as a pastor, along with Richard and Ken, if we are concerned every week, well, we've got to make sure that this, this, this building is, you know, working and functioning perfectly. If our anxiety is always, you know, the taste of the coffee or this or that, or if we're so anxious about this, then we are totally missing the point and we've lost sight of our identity and we've lost sight of our mission. But it really is simple. What is the key? Just be concerned about following and worshiping in Jesus. Receiving him as the one true God. Seeking him with all of your heart and your soul and your strength and your mind. If Jesus is the light of the world, then the key to making disciples of this King Jesus is to have the concern of letting his light lighten your life. That ought to be your one concern. And this is our one concern. So having chosen King Jesus as our king, are we letting him, who is the light of the world, shine in and through us? This is the concern of our text. Choosing King Jesus, receiving him the light. Without this church, and I can also say that's, remember, church, you, me, Isaac. Without this Isaac, you will lose your identity, and I will fail in my mission as being a member of the church. I want, to look, I want us to look at this text. And we'll look at it in three parts. The first part is in verses 29 through 32. Let me read it, okay? <clears throat> this is in Luke chapter 11. When the crowds were increasing, okay, so more and more people are coming as Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem. Crowds are increasing. Not all of them are believers, okay, but they're attracted to Jesus or they want to condemn him, okay? When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be, a, you know, we can apply a sign, to this generation. So Jesus, he sees the crowd, and he can see through, and he sees into their hearts. 
And he, he calls them evil. This is an evil generation. Now, we might think, Jesus, like, hey, like, that's pretty harsh. But Jesus can see their hearts. And why? Why does he say this is an evil generation? Well, they seek for a sign. If you go back to verse 16 in chapter 11, you'll know this, that after Jesus cast out a demon, what does it say? But This is in verse 15. But some of them said, he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And look at verse 16. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. Now, it's interesting. A sign here is not just another miracle. Oh, oh. She's so tough. Thank you guys for helping Carrie. Okay, they'll watch out for her. All right. <coughs> um, a sign isn't just another miracle, okay? I mean, the, all of these crowds have seen miracle after miracle of Jesus right in front of their faces. What did Jesus just do? He cast out a demon from them. I mean, what further sign in that sense do you need? What other miracle do you need than Jesus looking at someone who's possessed and just saying, I rebuke you in the name of, well, he doesn't have to say in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you and the demon fling. So this is not just another sign. They've seen that, but this is something, they're, what they're asking for, remember this is testing, right? What they're looking for is something immediate that might confirm a miracle authority of prophecy. They're testing him. And in one sense, think of it this way. They believe themselves to be, these are the Jews, they believe themselves to be sort of sitting on their own thrones as the teachers, as the judges, and they're looking at Jesus and they're saying, hmm, well, just show me a quick immediate token uh, uh, that you can confirm that this miracle is actually true and actually right. They're placing themselves as the judges rather than just receiving the light of Jesus and his authority. So this is evil, okay, because they're letting unbelief reign and they're demanding from the king, okay? They're demanding from the king, and that is wrong. Jesus then says, no sign. He's like, I'm not going to play your games, right? No sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. Now, we thankfully just went through Jonah uh, just a couple months ago, and we know, and I'll just say this about Jonah really quickly. I won't go through the whole story, but remember, Jonah was a prophet in Israel, and God called him to go to Nineveh to tell them to repent, Nineveh was, at the time, a uh, Gentile nation, uh, a city, very, very vile, very violent, not a good place. Jonah doesn't want to do it because he knows that God is forgiving. And if he goes and he preaches repentance and they repent, Jonah knows that they're going to, you know, God's going to have mercy upon them, so he flees. We know the story. He's in this crazy storm, right? They throw him overboard because he knows that um, it's because of him that the storm, has caused, the storm has come. And then what happens? This is the Sunday school story. You know, he gets swallowed up by a whale, and he's in there for three days, three nights, and then he spit back up on the sea. Then he travels finally to Nineveh, and he says, in 40 days, you will, you know, perish. And what happens? The king and the whole city, they repent. They put on sackcloth, they put on ashes, they they humble themselves and bow down before God and say, God, have mercy upon us. An incredible, incredible story. So Jesus is saying, no sign is going to be given you guys except the sign of Jonah. And then he says, as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will Jesus, me, the son of man, become a sign and be a sign to you. Now to help us understand this, I want to go to Matthew's um, version of this. So you can just listen to this. This is in Matthew chapter 12. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And listen to this. This is what Matthew writes. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So here, just very basic. The attestation and the confirmation of Jonah's preaching of repentance seems to be his miraculous deliverance. 
So just as Jonah himself was a sign of someone that's been miraculously delivered, so will the Son of Man become and be a sign of someone who's miraculously delivered. And you can obviously see the three days, three nights in the fish, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But, I mean, the glory and the splendor of Jesus' sign is so much greater. He literally dies and comes back to life again. So, just so, Jesus' attestation of his authoritative preaching, his authority, his miracles, his casting out of demons, will be his death and resurrection. And notice the future tense. If you look in our, in our, in our verse there, in uh, verse 30, it says, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. He's saying, there will come a moment, evil generation, where the greatest sign of all signs will happen when I, myself, will be in the heart of the earth for three days and come to life again and be delivered. So listen, listen. Jesus won't give these evil unbelievers, you know, this little authenticating token on demand. You know, he's not going to take their test, right? That's not who he is. He's the king. He's not going to take their test, but he will give them a sign to trump all signs, but it's future, something they're going to have to put their faith in. Okay, that's the first part. The second part in verses 31 through 32, Jesus gives these two Old Testament analogies about the queen of Sheba and Jonah again. So look at verse 31. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. What is this referring to? King David, right? Amazing reign of Israel, but I would even say that his son Solomon had an even more glorious reign. Some of you know the reign of Solomon. Uh, right when Solomon became king, God came to him and said, ask anything and I'll give it to you. You know the story. Solomon says, I want wisdom to help govern your people. God says, that's amazing. You didn't ask for riches. You didn't ask for women. You didn't ask for power. You asked for wisdom. I'm going to give you wisdom, but I'm going to give you everything else as well. And at that time in the history of Israel, this was the moment where Israel shone. It's almost as if the kingdom had been reestablished. Okay? The, the boundaries of Israel got widened. There was peace for the land for many, many years. And all these other nations started to see the beauty and the wonder and the wisdom of Israel because their king was a king that looked to God. This was the purpose of Israel all along. And we saw that starting to come about in Solomon's life. So way down in the south, you had this queen of, of Sheba, maybe in, in modern-day Ethiopia, who hears of the wisdom of Solomon. So she takes the long route. It literally says in our scripture here, will rise up, uh, what does it say? She came from the ends of the earth to help us show the long way that she came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And she did. And when she was there, you can read about it in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles, she was astounded. She's like, oh, and it literally says there was no more breath in her when she saw the wisdom and the wonder and the beauty of the servants. Everything was working perfectly. There was no tyranny. It was perfect. It was ideal. And she just lost her breath. She's like, this is amazing. So that's what Jesus is referring to here. And what is important, what the analogy here is this, that she, a Gentile queen, a woman, okay, traveled all the way to Jerusalem to see and hear the incredible wisdom of Solomon, which is an understatement. No one else has been wiser or wise except Jesus. She did all of that to see the wisdom of Solomon. Her action of traveling all the way proved where her heart was. But the present generation that Jesus is talking about is hard-hearted with unbelief, and they're selfishly demanding a little token from King Jesus. So you can see the contrast that Jesus is making here between the, the, the Gentile queen seeing the wisdom and traveling all the way, and her heart is one to say, I'm here to receive, whereas the present generation are seeing Jesus and yet folding their arms and saying, ah, oh, show us more. Let's test you a little bit more. So Jesus pronounces great humiliating judgment to these Jews by saying, this Gentile woman is going to rise up at the judgment with you guys, and she, a Gentile woman, are going to condemn you Israelite men. And that would have been like, like, that's a woe. That is a, a judgment upon these Israelite men, these Jewish uh, Israelite men, absolutely. The next thing he says is in verse 32. It's very similar. The, um, <clears throat> the men of Nineveh will also rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So then you have, again, Jonah's story. He, he gets spit out of the whale. He goes all the way to Nineveh, and he preaches, and they all repent. 
These are vile, Gentile, stinky, violent sinners. And they repented. They saw their sin at the preaching of this prophet who's been miraculously delivered and is now preaching to them as repentance. And they repent. And the very same thing, you can see the, the, both those verses, 31, 32, uh, are mirrored. The Ninevites, though Gentile sinners, they repented at the preaching of Jonah, who had been miraculously delivered. Their action of repenting proved their heart and what they saw in Jonah. But the present generation with Jesus, hard-hearted, unbelief, folded arms, want to test Jesus more. So Jesus again pronounces judgment. Not only will the queen of the south rise up and condemn you guys, but all of these vile Ninevites who've repented, they're going to rise up and condemn you as well, which would have been another really hard hit. Now, the repeated refrain that we can't get away from is this, something or someone greater than both Solomon and Jonah is here. And that's why the judgment is even worse. Jesus' wisdom is eons past Solomon's. Jesus' deliverance is eons past Jonah's and his preaching and his authority. I mean, this is the light of the world that has come. He is walking before them and demonstrating with power and wisdom. I mean, all through the Gospels, what do we hear? The refrain, even the winds and the waves obey him. Wow, what preaching with what authority. He talks to the unclean spirits and they leave. I mean, you can't, he multiplies five loaves and two, like, this is amazing. Something greater than Solomon and Jonah are here. And if the queen and the Ninevites saw and repented upon these little messiahs, you could say, the fact that you are refusing to believe in King Jesus, great condemnation and great judgment um, to come. Does that make sense? Something greater is here, and he's right before them. The king of all wisdom stands before their very eyes, and yet they have the audacity to sit in judgment over him, demanding him to bow down to their selfish wants, wanting to test him as if they are the ones in charge. So, back then and presently today, this is important, and I don't want to, this is just as a side note, we aren't just tickling ears here. We want to preach what the word says, okay? For then and now, to respond negatively or not to respond at all to King Jesus, whether back then or whether today, it means storing up condemnation for yourself on the day of judgment. We can't get away from that. So my only plea for those who have yet to choose King Jesus is this. Humble yourself before him. Just like I need to humble myself before him every single day. Humble yourself before him. See his mighty works. Believe in his resurrection, that great sign and choose him to be the king you worship and serve because there is no neutrality. You worship King Jesus or you reject King Jesus and you wait condemnation. Those are the two ways. The last part of our text is in verses 33 through 36. Jesus now moves almost suddenly into using this imagery to describe the importance of receiving him as king. So I'm just going to read this. Verses 33 through 36. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in the cellar or under a basket, but on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light, but when it is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright. W-H-O-L-L, -L, like fully, completely bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. I love this. Now, the first verse there, a lamp is lit to light a room. I'm not going to, I don't really need to do any exegesis on that. That makes sense. Why did we turn the lights on? So we can see. A few months ago, the power went out at our house. So what did we do? And Maybe it went out at your house as well. We lit candles, and I didn't take a candle and put it in the dryer and shut the dryer door. That makes no sense. Right? And put it in the dishwasher or in the toilet. I put it up high or on the table so it would give as much light so that the darkness now is cast away by the light, right? So Jesus, like everyone gets that. I was like, of course, that makes sense, Jesus. I got it. Now, verse 34, follow along here. Jesus is saying this, that your eye <clears throat> is the lamp of your body. And by body here, he's referring to your life, okay? Healthy eyes which are lit lamps, because the eye is the lamp of our body, so a healthy one is one that's actually bright, 
to the, it's, you know, you've lit it with the lighter, it's, or with the match, depending on who you are, right? It's lit, and what happens? Well, your whole life is now lit. There's light and truth within you. But bad eyes, which, yes, you guessed it, there's like lamps that are not lit, <laughs> candles with the wick there, but with no light, it just sustains the darkness in your whole life. Does that make sense? He's using symmetry. Your eyes are the lamps. And when they're good, they're lit, which provides light and truth in you. But when they're bad, they're not lit. And it just remains dark within you. And verse 35, this is the imperative. This, in all of this, Jesus has been describing, 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 and he finally gets to his moment to say, here's my command. And this is what I want us to go away with. This is the big part. Verse 35, are you ready? Be careful. Be careful. Right? It's like when my kids are, we're at the park and they're running down a hill and it's, I, I, I'm always scared when toddlers and two-year-olds run down hills because oftentimes the momentum is quicker than their legs can hold, right? They fall down. It's always funny to watch someone else's kid, but it's heartbreaking when it's your own. Um, but what do you say? What do we say? Be careful, <laughs> please be careful. This is, I mean, we're not going to overcomplicate Jesus' command. He's like, if that's true, if, if this is true about your life and the truth in you, then be careful. Be careful about how your eyes are, whether they're healthy or not healthy. Why, then, does he say, be careful? Because if what we believe to be, quote-unquote, light in us is actually darkness due to having bad eyes, then our whole life is still in the dark. We're dark. But verse 36 kind of gives, on the other hand, when your life is full of light, with no darkness remaining, then you're going to be completely bright, like a lamp shining its rays. So what's the idea here, okay? Eyes, figuratively speaking, are like gateways, these lamps, these gateways that bring light, that bring the truth into our lives. So how do we fill our lives with light? How do we light the lamps of our eyes so that they're good? By seeing and seeking after the light of the world. That's it. By seeking after, striving for the true light. And who is the true light? Despite what modern day teachers say, there is no such thing as inner light in us. That just needs to be awakened and found. You can keep digging into yourself to find the light in you, you will find no light. And that is a result of the fall because of sin and the corruption of man. You will not find light in yourself. It has to be somewhere else. King Jesus is the light of the world. John 8, 12, I am, Jesus says, the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, the light of truth, the light of life, the light of everlasting life. John 12, 46, Jesus says again, I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. So how do we ensure that these eyes that are lamps of our bodies are good? by having them lit. And how are they lit? Not by lighting them ourselves, but by looking upon the light of the world. That's how they're lit. So what's the point of all this? How do these passages connect? Okay, really quick. King Jesus has come as the light of the world. His powerful life of truth and love demands a choice from all of us, every single person in this world. You embrace him as king, you look upon him, see him as the light of the world, or you reject him as king. You turn away, just like these Jews here did. Many will selfishly demand from, from Jesus, from God, while enjoying their darkened lives of unbelief. But Jesus will not cater to their demands and their evil tests. But he's pointed once for all to himself on the cross and resurrection as a sign. He's like, I'm not going to... I remember one time trying to convince my friend that God was real, and I said... Okay, God, I'm going to tell my friend to go outside. We were camping. We're going to go outside, and you're going to look up the star, and you're going you're to do a shooting star so that he'll know that you're here. And it didn't happen, right? Now, I don't think my heart was evil. I was just really young and kind of immature here. But God's like, Isaac, the cross, there's your sign. That's your sign. Dead for three days, resurrected. Our faith rests on that. If that didn't happen then we are the most to be pitied, Paul said, because there'd be nothing to confirm Jesus. But Jesus has pointed once for all to the cross and the resurrection. And listen, history 
has never, you know, let's say caused people from disbelieving that things actually happen. I don't think there's anyone today that disbelieves Alexander the Great lived, maybe some. There are always going to be some. <laughs> yes, we're 2,000 years down the road, but the historical attestation that we have of the resurrection is mind-blowing. It's what brought my mom and my dad to salvation. They were both pot-smoking hippies in, in Vancouver in the mid-'80s, but they felt like maybe something needs to be more. My dad had already had two marriages. My mom had been through a lot. They're like, okay, we've kind of done the world thing. Let's just see if there's something in the spiritual world that we can really hang on to, right? So they walk into the church, and the, the pastor says, here's how we can know that the resurrection happened. And my parents were like, what? I thought that was all mythical and just, like, ridiculous, but it actually happened? And their lives were changed. Praise the Lord. They saw the sign, and they saw the light, and they believed. To see Jesus, <clears throat> oh, sorry, to remain in the state, then, though, that refuses King Jesus, for whatever reason it may be, is to have as Jesus says, bad eyes. Eyes that are not looking with faith to the light of the world, that are not seeing the sign. And therefore, those who have bad eyes have lives of darkness and condemnation awaits. But to see Jesus for who he is, to have faith in him and his resurrection, to seek him with your everything is to have good eyes, as Jesus says. Eyes that are looking with faith to the light. And therefore, they have whole lives of light that now exist as lights to light others. So bringing it back now to the mission, the identity, the concern of the church. The key for us, individually and corporately, to effectively make disciples and followers of King Jesus is that we receive him as the light of the world. Our one concern, church, is not, again, that we have cushy seats, is that we have a perfect kids program, is that we have stunning songs and all these things. Our one concern is that we individually and we as a church follow and worship King Jesus. That's it. Let's not overcomplicate it. And I don't want Richard and Ken and I and all of us to be anxious and just like ridden with all this fear of how can we do this and how can we keep people and how do we keep our budget up and blah, blah, blah. That's not our concern. Our concern is to worship King Jesus, to receive him as the one true God, seeking him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Good eyes are those that let his light in and enlighten us so that we might light the world. For we are the light of the world even now, called to do good works, that Jesus says, part of making disciples, right? So that the world would see the Father and glorify him. If all our concern and anxiety is going towards making this building or our programs stunning and amazing and we're anxious and concerned about it, then what's that going to cause people to walk in? They're going to walk in, they're going to see everything and be like, wow, you guys are amazing. You guys are awesome. Look at the way that you're serving the community with food. Look at the way that you're doing this. Wow, you guys are amazing. Is that what Jesus wants? You are the light of the world. The city on a hill cannot be hidden. Uh, do your good works so that you would be praised? No. So that you're Father would get the glory. So I guarantee that if our concern is less about making our institution and our kingdom here, like our little kingdom, great, if our concern is less about that, is now on our knees, worshiping King Jesus as the light of the world, letting him lighten us, and spreading his light out, then people are going to come and be like, whoa, whoa, there's something different here, and their gaze is going to look forward and up to the Father. That's what we all want. So as Jesus said in verse 35, here's the imperative, here's the application to all of us, and to Isaac, Isaac, be careful. Be careful, lest the light in me is darkness. Be careful, Isaac. Are you looking to the light? Are you worshiping King Jesus? Are you letting him light the lamp of my eyes, which is the lamp of my body, which means I'm filled with light, which means I'm actually beaming the light of life and the light of Jesus out to others? Be careful. Be careful careful. Ensure that you have the light. The truth is, we as disciples and the church, we will have lost our identity and lost our mission if we lose the light. If we take our eyes off King Jesus and let the house of our lives become darkened, then a million other concerns will take the first place. Is our life in our church void of power because we've lost sight of the light of the world? 
So ensure that you have the light. Embrace King Jesus today. Let the true identity and mission of the church, of you, begin to work itself out as you worship and look to the light of the world. We spoke a lot about the cross, this great sign um, of his death and his resurrection. His death and his resurrection, as we know, which we need to be reminded of all the time, every day, is that even though we were condemned already, because Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. That's not the kind of God God is. He didn't come in to be like, you're all, I'm going to smite you all. That's not what Jesus is doing. They were condemned already because of their sin. But Jesus came into the world to save the world, to save it, to seek and to save the lost. And on the cross, what he did was he received the punishment of the rebellion that keeps us in the darkness. And he sustained it all. He bore it all upon himself. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2 that on the tree, he bore our sin in his body, on the tree, and he died. And, And sin's demand was paid. And God's justice was given by the death of Jesus Christ. But he rose again. And now any of us that look to that sacrifice look to Jesus and turn from our rebellious ways and believe what he's done, are liberated, saved, freed from sin's bondage and transformed. You don't do anything. You don't got to tithe. You don't got to go to church. You don't got to do these things. You just got to believe, repent and believe and it's yours and you will be transformed and you will live a holy life forever with Jesus. We're going to take communion as a way